Welcome, everyone, to the 11th International Adaptive Scuba Symposium. Tonight, we're going to have Dr. Gail Karen Levy, who's going to be introducing us to some of the research she did years ago on adaptive scuba. Tonight, we'll be focusing on occupational therapy, and we're very excited that some of the occupational therapy doctoral candidates will be part of our panel and be able to talk about how the different therapies work with adaptive scuba and scuba therapy. Uh, tomorrow night, we'll be talking about adaptive training, and we'll have instructors from all over the world joining us to talk about the benefits of adaptive scuba. And then the final night, we'll be talking about recreational therapy and how that becomes part of play and work and how that complements the things we're doing underwater. Imagine the possibilities and stay with us for the next three days. Thank you. Hello, my name is Gail Corrine Levy and I'm an occupational therapist and educator working at Queen Margaret University, Edinburgh. And I've been asked to talk to you today about a um, study that I conducted as part of my undergraduate um, programme here at Queen Margaret University, Edinburgh. And the topic of this study was the psychosocial aspects of scuba diving for people with physical disabilities and I've taken an occupational science perspective. So I'll start with telling you a little bit about myself. I um, grew up in Israel and have always been close to the sea. Um, I started diving about in the early 1990s um, and was very much taken by this occupation and um, every aspect of it, the social life, the beauty of the environment and the thrill of the sport. Um, and so for a while, I saw my future in, in the diving world in Israel. Um, so I'd sort of risen through the ranks for want of a better, a better expression um, and uh, became a dive master, then an assistant instructor, then a, uh, did my nitrox training and all sorts of other endorsements um, and then became a full, fully qualified open water instructor. And it was at that time that um, the International Association for Handicapped Divers as it was known, um, it was introduced in Israel. And so a chance meeting with somebody who said, you know, we're going to start a program for instructors to become um, diving instructors for um, what was then known handicapped divers. Um, and they thought that this would be something that would really suit me. And indeed, um, they were absolutely right. So I did my training um, about 1996 and uh, ran the first course in Israel for, um, again, in inverted commas, handicapped divers, um, and was very much taken by um, the power of this occupation and um, how transformative it was um, at the time. Uh, and then I actually rolled into becoming an occupational therapist through this because it very much inspired me to look for the connection between doing um, and becoming and doing and being transformed. So this is how I actually ended up becoming an occupational therapist. I came to train in uh, Edinburgh and stayed. A little bit about the background to the project. Um, this was uh, part of the undergraduate programme at Edinburgh Queen Margaret University. We were asked to um, conduct a small piece of research. Uh, all along I knew I was going to um, actually link my passion for diving with this research area and towards my final year of training um, I started thinking about how I would actually do that so was starting digging into the literature to see what existed um, I, it was always ever going to be something to to do with diving um, and uh, I have to say I was discouraged by some of the tutors in the program from doing it because they basically said there wasn't enough literature to lean on but I was insistent um, as is frequently the case with me that when I want to do something I do it and I do it absolutely properly so um, I just plowed on and started looking for literature and did some um, background legwork um, to actually um, get the project going and part of that background legwork was to actually make contact with um, a person I heard about through the International Association for Handicapped Divers um, Fraser Bathgate and luckily enough he actually was fairly close to 
where I was um, based in Edinburgh. So we actually met for a coffee. Now, um, big shout out to Fraser because it was actually through one conversation with him that I, I got the direction that I needed for this project that I came away from a simple chat over coffee and mainly the chat was about diving and not, ne not necessarily about research methods but I came away with a very clear vision of what I wanted to, to do with this project. Um, Fraser is one of the senior figures in the diving world in the UK. Um, he has a lived experience of disability um, and a huge depth of understanding in the field. So I'm very grateful for that conversation um, 20 years ago that really set me up for um, a good project. So in digging through the literature, it became very clear that uh, there were some themes that were going to underpin the project. I didn't actually look for any scrap of literature I could find. Um, it was random books that were published in the late 80s and early 90s, um, as well as any journal article that could possibly link um, what I needed, which was the value of participation with an, an, an adventure sport. Um, so a lot of literature digging uh, clearly revealed that I was going to take an occupational slant or an occupational perspective on quality of life. Um, so much more beyond whether one can dress themselves, whether one can um, go to work and much more around life satisfaction from the things that we do. Um, so this was an informing um, part of the literature that I looked at and I specifically looked, of course, at leisure occupations to kind of get a flavour for how that impacts on quality of life. Of course, all the other things that we do, work, um, activities of daily living, they are as important, but there was something very unique about the satisfaction that comes from leisure, which I think uh, we can all identify with. The next theory that underpins this project is the theory of flow. And um, for those of you that have never heard of flow, this is a concept that's very familiar to occupational therapists, but of course it's not widely known um, beyond psychology and, and the realms of occupational therapy. So it's worth just highlighting what this is. And I promise you'll, you'll understand exactly what I mean. So um, the term flow was um, coined by Csikszentmihalyi in the late 70s. And in a sense, this is a term that refers to a state in which people carrying out a certain activity gain this intrinsic reward from doing the activity or from participation. It's a state in which a person is completely involved. So it presents this constant challenge um, and this challenge is at the right level. So somebody doesn't feel like they are over challenged or under challenged, which really allows them to be in a state of flow. Flow, according to Csikszentmihalyi, is a state in which we lose sense of time. Nothing else seems to matter and we become completely devoted and absorbed in that activity. So hopefully that sounds familiar and you can see how the moment you read about flow and if you've ever done scuba diving, you know that that's the perfect fit. And lastly, of course, and how not, I needed to delve into the psychosocial aspects of sports participation. These are clearly described in the literature for years and years. Um, and essentially, I was looking for anything beyond the improvement in physical health and um, looking at any gains that could come from social participation, any gains that can come from doing something that improves your confidence, improves your self-perception, uh, body image, sense of self, etc. cetera. Um, locus of control, of course, uh, is also comes into play. So these kind of themes were really important in underpinning the project. And so the project itself. So as is the case with any um, project, you have to set objectives. And I um, dug out my old dissertation from the year I had completed my degree and found that um, the objectives actually went beyond the potential of the scuba diving in terms of improving um, psychological and social functioning, but also 
um, interestingly, because I, I didn't remember this 20 years on, uh, opening this new avenue for future research into the benefits of sports and physical activity within the discipline of occupational science. So I was looking very much for an occupationally based endeavor to look at how occupation itself and leisure occupations specifically um, could, could form this new and in interesting avenue for research. And of course, because this was a very small scale study, I wanted to just check whether it was feasible to conduct this kind of study, looking at the recruitment, looking at the data collection and what um, may be the yields, so that with a view that um, future studies could potentially rely on this, or indeed myself um, could potentially go into um, further research in the field. As it so happens, that didn't pan out that way. My research ended up concentrating mainly on people who've survived a stroke, but I still hold a huge amount of passion for this field of research. So what did I actually do? So in terms of the methodology that I employed, this was a descriptive phenomenology. So phenomenology is concerned with describing how people perceive and interpret their existence. It's very much about um, how one exists in the world and one um, interprets and um, uh, lives their experience, but also it can specifically be about an event or an occupation. This particular type of qualitative research is very relevant for occupational therapy, because if you want to explore what motivates somebody to take part in a certain activity or occupation, it's obvious that phenomenology may well give you those answers. There are other ways to do qualitative research, of course, but given this was a small scale research, and unfortunately it wasn't appropriate for me to be resident within a diving community at the time. So the constraints of this project meant that um, it was going to be a phenomenological investigation. So through diving contacts, I uh, managed to uh, get in touch with a uh, adaptive diving center um, elsewhere in the UK, this wasn't in Scotland, it was in a different nation of the UK, um, and this club specialised in adaptive diving, so that was essentially what the club did. Um, I got um, the name of somebody, I made contact out of the blue, introduced the topic, told him what the study was about, and asked if he thought that anybody may be interested. He said immediately, yep, I think you would easily find people. So he advertised the study and four people came forward. Um, and then one person um, withdrew before that we even managed to establish the consent procedures. Um, so I had three participants who took part. Because of the distance between where I was based and the dive club, and by definition, the people who lived around um, where the dive club was located, um, I decided that the best thing to do would be telephone interviews. So that was due to practical um, reasons. Essentially, I think if I had more time, it would have been beneficial to simply travel to the location and interview people face to face and have a good old chat. Um, it ended up that we conducted um, 50 um, minute long interviews which were tape recorded and when I say tape recorded I mean tape recorded this was a long time ago so I had a tape recorder connected to the telephone and recorded um, all of what people said and essentially um, spent all that time looking at people's diving experiences and their perception of the way the um, occupation of diving impacted on their lives, their feelings um, about participating and their feelings about themselves. So it was quite an in-depth, um, there was a lot of room for uh, in-depth discussion. We engaged as a quality mechanism um, in peer examination. So once the data were all transcribed and um, I sent some of the data uh, after I started the analysis to a supervisor who was able to both listen to a transcript and then also um, have a check of uh, how I analysed 
um, my data. So that was one of the quality mechanisms. And the other quality mechanism was actually to use what is known as a reflexivity diary. This is very simply a way of um, journaling um, your feelings, your perceptions, your thoughts, and all of your biases about the um, topic and to keep those in check. So essentially saying that you're not hearing things that were not said, that you're not interpreting things that did not exist um, in the data, because I had to admit, I was very biased. I inherently felt that this occupation yielded loads of gains for people. So it was really important that I stay true to the data that I found through the process of reflexivity. So that helped me in the analytical process. And I engaged in um, good old fashioned thematic analysis. Again, there are much more modern ways of doing thematic analysis these days. But um, when I conducted this project, um, and essentially because there were only three participants, I was literally with printed pages of text, different color of highlighters, cutting up um, the transcripts and placing them in a big thematic analysis. So creating a matrix, a physical matrix on the floor of my living room with lots of bits of cut paper and then being able to shift those about until I was happy with different things fitted under different brackets. And if all of that sounds a little bit weird, then hopefully showing you this next slide helps things come, come together. So essentially, what I found from talking to three participants, all of whom were male, two were wheelchair users, and one was um, uh, living with an amputation, um, I found that I could categorize all of the data from those three in-depth interviews into four broader categories. And these were freedom from equality, enhancement of social experiences, the optimal experience and enhancement of self-concept. So in terms of freedom of equality, and for each one on these slides, I've put a little snippets of what um, people actually said. So in terms of freedom and equality, there were um, themes around having no, no physical restriction during this occupation, that disability wasn't an issue, that those who were wheelchair users said it's wonderful to be out of the wheelchair. It's wonderful to not be seen as disabled. So visibly, I look equal, I am equal. And, and one participant said, I am a human being who is equal to others. And this particular um, quote actually um, very much linked with that person's increased confidence because they felt equal, they felt more empowered, they felt more confidence in themselves. So I categorized that under this enhancement of self-concept because people told me that they felt in control, that they were in control of their occupation and their environment, that they had the skills to master the environment on the occupation. And of course, um, that coping with the challenges that this particular occupation presented people was a huge sense of achievement. A couple of um, the participants actually said that they were able to, um, quote, brag to their friends, they are able to dive, they are divers, whereas their friends felt they couldn't do something like that, that it was far too risky or far too scary. So actually coping with a challenge gave people this great sense of achievement. And of course, if you remember what I said a few minutes ago about the theory of flow, coping with the just right challenge, being absorbed, getting this huge sense of achievement, the intrinsic reward that comes from the occupation all links with an optimal experience. So that is flow. So what people told me was um, along the lines of um, abandonment of their self-awareness, not thinking about themselves as disabled, looking the same, not thinking about their prosthetic or thinking about their wheelchair, really enjoying themselves. I mean, it actually comes down to the fact that it's an optimal experience if there is immense enjoyment. And that is really important. We can be very absorbed and in flow when we're studying, but 
that not necessarily would be classed as a very enjoyable experience. Yes, there were lots of rewards from studying, but I, I don't know many people that would say, oh, I absolutely enjoy um, being absorbed in, in, um, in this occupation of studies. So um, the optimal experience being so enjoyable was very important. And of course, this intense concentration, again, you can get that from work, you can get that from um, studying, but there's something about intense concentration in this different environment that really leads to that total absorption. And the last theme was along the lines of enhancing the social experience of those who are participating. And these are um, concepts from a bigger social group, meeting new people, uh, meeting people outside of support groups. So a lot of people, um, it, it, some of the participants mentioned um, that they had support groups for other people who used wheelchairs. And here's a group of people that they come together with and they're nothing to do necessarily with disability. They are all to do with the occupation and the sport. So expanding their social groups, having more friends from different parts, not necessarily friends from their village or their town. And a really important part of the social experience, of course, is the buddy system. Really powerful statements about putting one's life in the hands of another because the buddy is responsible, as you know, but also about being a buddy. So that was also equally important that, that the person doing the diving and um, both people were able to act as buddies and that in itself is very empowering. And of course, there were other um, elements of the social experience which were to do with the dive scene. People very much um, talking about diving outside of the dive itself, enjoying a beer after the dive. These are all hopefully very familiar scenes to yourselves as divers, um, part of um, the, the scene that very much enhances the social experience and is very much seen as fun. So if we look at diving as a meaningful occupation and we recognize that it is the just right challenge, and these are very early writings from Jörg Saitau, um, and that it, it brings this immense enjoyment, satisfaction, and a sense of competence. All of these things that, that the participants told me are very much consistent with the literature on sports participation, and as well as the literature on purposeful activity. What was very clear that diving as an occupation was a leveler. Diving meant that people were able to abandon their wheelchair or abandon their prosthetic and move in the water, looking the same way as any other diver would and moving in ways that they find more difficult on land. And that was really important to people. And that was one of the powerful aspects that was found through um, this study that the diving had that potential to to basically take the wheelchair out of wheelchair sports which is not my own quote this comes from um, another author which I quoted in my paper the dive scene really affording this integrated social experience was really important so while that particular club um, was specialist in adaptive diving, they would go on trips with other clubs, which meant that people were very much integrated into the scene um, and that very much enhanced people's quality of life and their perception of themselves as social beings. And of course, we spoke about flow in the previous slides and the writings of Csikszentmihalyi, um, very much around abandoning your self-awareness being free from impairment and gaining immense enjoyment from this activity. Now, I did not do this in the original paper that I published, and I actually didn't look at um, the findings of this study through the, uh, the person environment occupation lens. So this is a, a model that's used in occupational therapy that looks at the person, environment and occupation and the interplay between the two. And I thought it would be interesting for the purpose of this talk, just to look or think a little bit about it within um, those uh, realms. So if we think of the person and their identity as a person, their personhood, 
Think of their confidence, their personal confidence. Think of the experiences that they brought and the experiences that they gain through participation. And of course, the assets that they have as people and all of what Scuba can do to hone in on those um, assets, to enhance the experiences, to enhance the confidence and to transform sometimes the identity of a person who's living with a disability before they came to diving. And the occupation itself, the diving as a leisure activity, diving is a, an activity that often involves travel if you're lucky enough and are able to travel elsewhere to go on a dive trip. And um, diving that very much involves skill mastery. So you are able to become this really accomplished diver and it doesn't matter how you ambulate on land, underwater, you're very much the master of that skill. And so this occupation is very unique in that sense. And of course, the environment itself. Um, how could we not talk about the environment as this beautiful underwater environment? Yes, some marine environments are very cold as they are in uh, the east side of the UK. But actually, if you go on a dive trip, it's often to um, more warmer waters and tropical um, underwater environments. And these, of course, are stunning. And so that in itself brings great gains. And of course, there's a social scene of diving, which we discussed, so your social environment. Um, the physical environment, of course, I forgot to mention the pool environment. So that in itself um, is also important to um, discuss because um, whether it is in the pool or in the ocean or the sea, um, there are still the benefits of being underwater and the buoyancy of the water. Um, and of course, these days, this was not part of my study, but these days we have good evidence that the buoyancy and the atmospheric pressure that you're under um, whilst diving has got um, links with reducing the pain experience. So there's lots of um, benefits to actually being underwater, which I'm sure you know of. Um, of course, we can't not think of institutional when we think about the environment, because these are very much um, those uh, laws and policies that guide us. And here is where I feel studies like this and any other study that is conducted these days has a role to play in actually bringing diving to the forefront, making sure that there are institutions that are able to support this activity to make it very accessible to all. And again, leveling that out. So it's not just as it was when I was a diving instructor um, back in the 90s, this activity that only the rich could participate in. So that in itself is um, a big area that I, could, I would love to see changing and um, making the activity very, very accessible throughout the world. And of course, the cultural environment which is all around the dive scene and um, the hierarchy within the dive world as well, and the various dive organizations that exist. So there's another way of uh, conceptualizing a study such as this. But as I say, this is not in the original paper. So I do feel very much that the future is bright underwater and I would encourage anyone who wishes to get in touch to simply drop me a line in the email below. Um, I'm very keen to talk diving with anyone who's interested to um, discuss it with me and I'd be very keen to also reach out and start new studies with anyone who's interested in forging new research. I feel that um, now is the time when um, we recognize how important leisure is in our lives, that we make time and space for leisure activities um, for all um, and not see leisure as a privilege, but rather as a right. So if anyone's interested, please just drop us a line and uh, I'd love to talk more with you. And here, this last slide just gives you a few um, of the references that I leaned on and you've got reference to my original paper right at the top. Thank you very much and I look forward to hearing from you. So welcome back. That was uh, Dr. Karen Levy, who did some very early research with occupational therapy and scuba diving. And we hope you enjoyed it. We're very thankful to her for recording that for us because she couldn't be here or be live with us tonight. 
Uh, what we have next for you is another pre-record, but it's a very interesting conversation that um, Dr. Karen Levy had with some of our occupational and rec therapy um, researchers. And they were very keen to talk with her and it's a, an interesting conversation. I hope you enjoyed as much as we did. All right. Welcome everybody to our panel discussion. So in our panel today, we have Dr. Gail Karen Levy, who is an occupational therapy faculty member at, is it Queen Mary? Queen Margaret University. Queen, Queen, Queen Margaret University in Edinburgh. And she did one of the foundational research studies on adaptive scuba diving and occupational therapy. We also have Amelia, who is an occupational therapy doctoral candidate from Keene University in New Jersey. And then we have Rachel, who is a recreational therapist. And myself, I am also an occupational therapy doctoral candidate from Indiana Wesleyan University. So we are going to have a discussion today on Dr. Gail Kahn-Levy's research on adaptive diving. And each of us are gonna have an opportunity to ask a question. So I'm going to start off our panel by asking, uh, in your opinion, now that your research is almost 15 years old and has been widely cited by other researchers, what do you feel like your impact has been on adaptive diving and your impact on uh, the discipline of occupational therapy? Thank you, Tori. Um, I have to be very honest and say that I, didn't think there was an impact for many years. So when I published the research, I felt um, there was an opening, there was a gap in the market. There wasn't, there weren't any studies that actually looked um, at the experience. There were some studies that looked at um, physiological changes and they had a little tag on at the end about people really enjoying diving, but there wasn't anything about how powerful scuba diving is as an activity, as an occupation. Um, so I felt, wow, there's a gap. Right, I shall publish this. Th this research was actually my undergraduate thesis. That's all it was. It was like a little exercise. Um, it wasn't even doctoral. Um, and so I thought, I'll publish it and let's see what happens. And, you know, 20 years on, I felt it took a long time for things to move. I think now there's much more interest and there's much more discussion about scuba diving and its potential and how wonderful it is. But it felt like a really, really slow start. So I would say wholeheartedly at the beginning, I didn't think it had any impact whatsoever. And then very recently in the last five years, I started getting some approaches. So that had demonstrated to me that perhaps there was a slowness, but also that things just organically evolved. Um, and so in terms of the uh, impact on scuba diving, I don't think my research had made a, a real impact on scuba diving itself. I think where I found some interesting links was when people had come to me saying, look, we're trying to get money for this charity to um, justify taking people who are either recovering from limb loss or, or, or whatever, on a diving course. So can you help us write this application? So that felt like impact on the ground. And that's by far what I would rather hear rather than lots of people citing my work because to know that this had made an impact on people's lives, you know, this study or other studies able to secure funding for a small charity to go away and dive is fantastic as far as I'm concerned. And in terms of the impact on the profession, again, I'm not sure because I think that there's been an interest in more exciting occupations, again, quite slowly. I think that when I first wrote the work, I had this idea that the only physiotherapy does water based stuff, that OT doesn't have anything to do with water. And I want to change that. And I think that um, maybe it did change. I don't know. But it was again, it was quite, quite novel at the time. And of course, no longer quite so novel now. 
<laughs> yeah, I agree. I feel like occupational therapy as a discipline has been slow to take up doing any intervention in the water. And I think you are amongst like-minded people in this panel right now that we really feel like occupational therapy and recreational therapy need to really be jumping in and getting involved in that because it is such a therapeutic environment. Yeah, yeah, there's no doubt. And I think um, that the, the, the benefits are so, so many and, the, and on so many different levels that I suppose... I, I feel, I, I think that the restricting factor is that not everyone is comfortable in the water. That, you know, that is, I grew up near the water. For me, that was my natural place to be and always did water sports. But if you didn't, and if you grew up landlocked in the middle of a country, far away from the sea, you know, don't particularly like swimming and you're an occupational therapist, why on earth would you think about water-based activities as something that you would do with somebody because it is about us and our preferences and our likes and our wants initially and then we kind of suggest things to people so I think it is a lot about ourselves as as where we're situated and our context and our upbringing and our likes but also maybe more research opens this out to say to people hey you haven't thought about this what about this this is a great way to do xyz and so it is about getting that word out there and research like you you are doing and work like you're doing rachel is fantastic because it it gets the word out there i like what you said about um it not being something that someone in your profession would necessarily think about and we're well, we don't have Eric, who is going to be our male representative, um, but Tori's going to share some of his questions. And one of the things that he's developed uh, specifically for Dive Heart, which we're sharing now, is an intake form for people to work with their therapist or a person that um, can help them identify whether uh, scuba, scuba diving or therapy in the water through scuba would be beneficial or something mm -hmm. of interest. So it's mm -hmm. kind of nice. Um, yeah. Amy, let's move to you. See, see if you have a question here you want to shoot out. Yes, I do. Um, so my question is, what do you think is an occupational therapist's role within the adaptive diving community? Mm -hmm. Okay, and so thanks, Amy, because that, that, I think that links a little bit with what Rachel was going to ask. Is that right, Rachel, about the yeah. kind of crossover? So maybe we can have a little chat about that together and, and sort of address those two uh, aspects. It's really interesting questions from both of you, and they're really important, I think. So in terms of, um, you know, where recreational therapy sits versus occupational therapy, I don't know if you know, but Recreational therapy is not a huge thing in the UK, for example. It's not a huge profession here. And so in my day-to-day -day life and existence as a program director for occupational therapy, I don't see a conflict because what I teach as an occupational therapist is leisure, <laughs> occupation, work, you know, sleep, etc., spirituality, but we don't tend to have a tension as such or, or any potential conflict but I actually think that scuba is one of those you know gold mines where you would have that conflict because scuba by definition is leisure and so if as an occupational therapist I'm interested in facilitating someone's leisure occupations of course I'm going to have a crossover with your role Rachel and so I think that that is quite interesting and because our roles are new, in a sense, around scuba, I think this is now the potential time for us to actually work that out. Because I don't think, have we bashed it out? Do we know where is this, you know, what's happening here? Who's stepping on whose toes, you know? And, and whether actually we should just come up with this really simple chart of how we're going to facilitate occupational, um, scuba diving as occupational therapist and as recreational therapist. I, I mean, in a really simplistic way, it seems to me that, you know, if an occupational therapist wants to go down the kind of physical, practical, let's find solutions to enable someone to do this independently, that seems like it's a kind of natural fit. 
but actually we're so much more than that so there's all you know where's all the mental health the social health the integration and all of that so I think that's is that right Rachel with my understanding is that where we would have that crossover with our roles yeah Yeah. so I suppose in a way I think we we've got this chance to work together on this without the hierarchy or any perceived hierarchy but I actually think well we have these people in the center of our work and these people want to dive or we want to suggest diving to them so why would an OT suggest diving why would a recreational therapist suggest diving how do we work together to use our skills as best we can to facilitate this fantastic transformative experience for somebody so I don't think I have an answer as to this is the role of OT you know I think that in many ways Um, There are some occupational therapists, I I admit I am not one of them, who come up with these hacks, you know, these things, yeah, you can do it this way, you can do it that way, and come out with products um, and are able to patent them. And here's a little market for for a, a tinkering type occupational therapist to come up with really fantastic innovations that are products that have got a market value in scuba. But there's all of that other stuff, you know, and and I suppose one of the questions somebody asked, I can't remember who, and I think it might have been you, Amelia, was about um, taking an occupational theory lens to to the work that we do. And and I suppose it links for me because, you know, if we take um, more of a Canadian approach, so the PEO or the CMOP, these are those two models that look at the whole you can't ignore leisure and leave it to somebody else. But equally, you've got to look at the environment and and the potential there and the fit and the fit between the person and the environment on the occupation. So I think, yeah, I mean, there might be some tensions, but but actually we've got to turn those into potential for for maximal success in, in actually getting scuba out there into people's lives. I think that's one thing that we've we've discussed, Tori and I have talked a lot about this kind of relationship of working together as a coach read or interdisciplinary team. And, you know, we have the same opinion of, well, we just want to serve the the divers as best as possible. We don't care about, you know, um, being the lead or being, you know, in charge or that hierarchy that you were talking about. It's so not about that. It's about, it's about the diver. It's about the participant, Mm -hmm. our consumer. And um, trying to um, ensure that we remove any kind of ego or any kind of, you know, um, like stepping on each other's toes and um, ensuring that it's diver focused, Mm -hmm. not about us. Right, of course. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. I love what you're all saying. I agree. And I feel like this is the generation that you guys, um, you know, you, Tori, Amy, Rachel, of occupational, recreational, even... Um, PTs that are going to come out and really I think you're going to start working together goodness knows whenever we have a dive heart trip everybody's working together and one of the first things we say on day one is leave your ego at the door Mm -hmm. we're all just here to help and have and have fun but we're all just here to help and it really does end up that way and I really Mm -hmm. like that this team has come together and you know going to move forward hopefully continued um, connection yeah, we've worked really well together when we were down together in Florida for the week and I loved it. I can't wait to work with you guys again. <laughs> yeah, oh, we need and other participants now. But it is so much about teamwork, isn't it? And it mm-hmm. is so much about, and, and in the same way that, I mean, you know, this is so far removed from, from a traditional clinical environment, but in a clinical environment, that would be the same. It would all be about that teamwork. And so I don't see it as hugely different other than, of course, the environment and the occupation that we do. But actually, um, diving in essence is about teams. When would you be diving on your own? N- never recreationally. And so, and so the, the service providers, so to speak, would also be working as a team with the diver at the center, yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, Rachel, your turn. Okay. Do you have one? I do, that kind of answered my second question. My first question, you kind of mentioned earlier the studies that have been released on the physiological effects that occur during scuba diving. And we know that there's been minimal studies, you know, there have been a couple out, um, but not very many, but we, you know, 
in specific uh, disabilities such as chronic pain, we've heard testimonies from these individuals uh, reporting relief at depth. And so at this time, you know, and moving forward in research, do you recommend that um, we, we look more into the physiological mechanisms that occur in these different pressure groups and why or why not to kind of um, in direction of future research? Sure, 100%. I think, you know, if there's any, chronic pain is a really good example, actually, of, of one of those conditions that one just has to learn to live with. Yes, there are ways of managing and, and there's lots of programs for it. But actually, if there could be a real difference with hyperbaric type medicine, then why would we not? So, I mean, I actually um, had cause to look at this uh, a few months ago, just quickly, a really quick literature search to look at. And, and there are some reviews out there. It's inconclusive. So whenever you find a, a systematic review or sco scoping review that tells you the, day, the, the evidence is inconclusive, of course, it's an opening for research. We've got to be right in there. But this is interesting because this isn't just putting somebody in um, a chamber and, and changing the pressure. This is actually about having fun at the same time. And so th that changes the game completely, I would say, you know, so we take the hyperbaric medicine and we say, okay, we have some evidence here, we need to research it more, but let's do it in a really innovative way. Let's do it in a real environment, not in a simulated or, or clinical environment. And then suddenly you think there's mm -hmm. other things. And I think this is why it's difficult because how do we separate this environment, which is stunning and, and enjoyable and blue and, 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 and relaxing? How can we separate the effect of all of that out from the effect of, of the increased pressure? And I think that's a really interesting question for research. And, and again, that just, it, there's huge potential there for scuba because of all of those, but I think it needs some clever thinking about how we would separate those out to, to actually look at the physiological effects as well as the um, psychosocial. But of course, it's very difficult to separate those. We know that ourselves as human beings, that you know, when we're physiologically happy, then we're psychologically happy, etc. So, so yeah, really interesting question and lots of room for research. All right, I think it's time to channel Eric. Did he have a, a question, Tori, that you feel we haven't covered? Uh, he did. This is more specifically related to your research. And this is something Eric and I spoke about in a meeting that we had just the two of us. He, um, wanted you to clarify more on your specific theme of freedom from impairment. So his question was, how does freedom from impairment affect occupational participation or performance? And more specifically, if an individual learns to adapt new occupations or learns how to perform their occupation from birth with a disability, how are they affected by experiencing freedom from impairment? Or what do they gain from freedom from, from impairment? Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> True to my nature, I don't think it's a simple answer. I think it's a fantastic question, but I don't think there's a simple answer because, because actually several years on, when you look at what does freedom from impairment mean, I see this actually at several levels. And, and if you ask me, what would I want to research more? This is it. This is this freedom from impairment. So, so yes, at a phys physical or physiological level, we have the, the water as, as an environment that actually allows movement, better movement, maybe reduces tone, maybe it helps the body relax. Fantastic. So the body can do other things. But of course, that's completely um, separate, but also completely linked with that sense of self. And, and the sense of self, when, when us as people feel free from impairment, whatever that impairment is, we can do more, can't we? When we feel liberated from something, we can do more. So the, the notion, um, and, in, and in, again, one of the participants in my original study said he was a wheelchair user, and he said being able to do something without the wheelchair is fantastic, is the best. And so that freedom from impairment is also about leveling the field. So you can dive and I can dive. And actually, I, I actually remember what, that interview that the, one of the participants said, you would never know that I had 
a disability because I look the same underwater. So that's also freedom, freedom from impairment, you know, that whole psychological freedom from impairment. And so I think that in terms of engagement, this is where diving has this massive potential because it's a leveler. You know, if you took, I often think, well, how does it differ from other sports that anyone can participate in? So if you take um, cycling and a person cycling and, and they've lost one limb, okay, that's not a huge impairment. They can do adaptive cycling and be exactly the same. But when you see them from a distance, you think, oh, they're adaptive cyclists. <laughs> but actually, I'm the diver hey diver hi you okay yeah i'm okay so that whole communication even underwater is level unless you really knew who you were diving with you wouldn't know the impairment or the handicap for, to use a, a quite an old word um so i think that this is why i think this um to answer this question is quite complicated because it's on those many many levels but i, I do firmly believe that once that freedom is felt by an individual, then there's a potential to channel and open the door to other occupations and to thrive in other areas of our lives. And again, I'm relating back to, to one of the participants saying, I speak to people and I say, I'm a diver. And they say, oh, I don't think I could do that. Wow, you can dive. And here I am in a wheelchair and they're walking and talking <laughs> and thriving in other areas of their lives, but they feel they couldn't dive. And here I am diving. That again is a very powerful message about what that participant felt about himself as a diver, first and foremost, an able diver, even though from a you know formal perspective, he's a disabled diver. So I think there's really interesting potential here with scuba to change the field completely and really enable people um, empowering their sense of self and, and empowering their uh, ability uh, um, to think of themselves as, as able to do this, that, etc. So I don't know if that yeah. answers the question specifically, Dory, but I think it is quite a complicated um, thing to discuss. Yeah, absolutely. I really like how you put that because I feel like that's been me as somebody who's new to the scuba world to and new to the adaptive scuba world as well to read the research and to hear from tina marie and jim with their experiences with dive heart and to hear from amy and rachel about their experiences one of the things that i think people feel really passionate about with scuba diving is that and we're calling it freedom from impairment in this chat but in other research it's called like um, returning to past roles or improved self-concept or improved occupational identity. And it's all of those, um, I want to call them like the psychosocial or just like psychological, I feel just like builders that's helping people re-engage in the occupations outside of scuba. Again, that's really the big draw, you know, because when you have the power in scuba diving to do the things that you can't do on land, that boosts and self-efficacy and self-concept and self-esteem is what's building you up in all other areas of your life. And I feel like that's really important. Are you finding yeah. similar stuff, Amy, in the people you're yeah. talking to? <laughs> yeah. You're, you're sitting there I'm nodding. Like, I'm nodding. Like, yeah, I'm currently like working on how I'm going to word my themes. I know that's not what we're discussing today, but um, yeah, no, it's definitely what I'm finding. And um, a lot, a lot of my writing currently, my results is like X, Y, Z leads to, you know, ABC. So, you know, all these different concepts that we're speaking about it, it leads to so many other um, areas of occupation in life. And, you know, as we're saying, self-concept, empowerment, self-efficacy, the feeling, the can do attitude that maybe they didn't have before, but then diving provides that mm -hmm. um, change of like mindset and new identity and um it's really awesome to see and i'm really excited writing it um and I'm it's just very like, powerful isn't it it's so powerful to hear people's narratives around that and 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 you know i often think is diving unique in that is it just diving that does that i think maybe not quite because there's some evidence from other 
what mm-hmm. we what would have maybe called in the past adventure sports. <laughs> I'm not sure <laughs> diving is, I mean, it's adventurous, but it's no longer this exclusive adventure sport that people don't do. Lots mm-hmm. of people dive. But I do think there's something quite unique about diving. And I'm not yeah. sure I can put my finger on it because if you read studies about skiing or even cold water swimming, so again it's in the water but it's not scuba diving so so Mm -hmm. there's quite similar narratives about sense of self and it's something about the achievement and it's something I think in the water and Mm -hmm. underwater about coping with that environment it is not the same we know that it is a completely different environment so Mm -hmm. you've got a lot of learning there to Mm -hmm. survive to be safe you can't just go 30 meters under and think yeah I'm fine so there's some of that as well which is hey I can do this this is this is dangerous and I'm doing this maybe if somebody grew up with a disability they were told don't do that that's really dangerous you can't access that 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 could be really dangerous to you and here they are actually thriving in this dangerous environment of course it isn't if it's controlled and done properly but there are I I do believe that deep down inside, there's this element in us as human beings that go, we don't really belong here. <laughs> That's the <a> fish. <laughs> and so actually, look at me, look at me, I'm breathing underwater. And I think somehow, you know, in our ancient psyche, that must be phenomenal for our brains to process. Look at me, I'm breathing underwater, mm-hmm. I'm coping, I'm safe, I'm doing this wonderful thing. And I think that in that sense, yeah, diving must be this unique experience that people have in this empowerment to do something and and that it transferred to other areas and yeah areas of life i apologize for my dogs i'm really sorry (laughs) that's okay that's part of life too we like to say that we cornered the market on zero gravity right Um, which helps a lot and you know everything you all are saying is stuff that we get to experience rachel you're probably the one closest um in in working with people with disabilities that go underwater and and, and the experiences that they've shared with us. Um, and it's, it is all of that that you've all mentioned. And it's great to experience as a person without a disability for now, um, but to, to be able to experience it with them and hear about it is amazing. Mm-hmm. There's, there's no doubt. And I think, you know, if I think back to um, the very first program that I ran in Israel, which was, it was just an exploratory thing. We got our um, uh, dive certificate, you know, training endorsements for working with people with disabilities and decided to set up a program for um, young people with hearing impairment. And actually, I remember thinking, they're at a distinct advantage to us because they just sat underwater and spoke. (laughs) And so we very quickly had to learn some, uh, you know, Hebrew sign language to be able to actually catch up with them because the problem was not in any way anything to do with diving. It was the fact that they were so at home in this silent world that I thought this was so interesting, turning this whole environment into an advantage someone so again this empowerment that comes from that from when you're operating in society at a disadvantage all of your life suddenly hey I can cook much better here than anyone else because I have this communication skill so no more writing on tablets but rather signing and being able to have a a a really social experience in a group which was phenomenal again we just sat and watched what was happening and it was just phenomenal to see the, the thrive that was um, happening in these young people. So yeah, there's there's so much potential. (laughs) That's awesome. Tori, did you want to take another question? I know it seems like we're letting her go twice, but she was Eric before. Now she's Tori. (laughs) No, it's okay. I will actually, I'm going to pass it along to Amelia and Rachel, and then I'll ask one final question for me at the end. Perfect. What do you have to say, um, Amy? Anything? Yeah, no, I guess, I mean, we, we slightly did speak about this, but I guess my question is like, where do you see the future of utilizing scuba diving like as a therapeutic means? Like, where do you see that going in the future, I guess? Or how do you see getting there? Mm, I wish I had a crystal ball. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, I have a lot of hope and speaking to you guys and actually 
um, re-engaging with the field after quite a few years out building a career, you know, in academia. And I think that actually re-engaging has been quite invigorating for me because I thought there is a future. Because when I first published, I thought this is science fiction to many people. This is not, you know, this is not going to go down very well. And I remember deliberately choosing the Canadian Journal because I thought that the occupational science slant would be um, of interest to the Canadian Journal and it was and so I kind of made that kind of right call there because before I thought who's going to take this paper what is the future of this there is no future but actually I think that's now changed I think we have a future ahead of us and I think that um, again over the past year I've had three approaches from doctoral students just looking for advice doing similar things and I thought that's amazing. That is just amazing. So I think, again, you know, you can't force people to go in the water. You can't force practitioners to want to be wet, <laughs> to want to be submerged, to feel comfortable. But those who do and those who perhaps come with a background of diving. Yeah, let's talk about this. Let's get this into programs. Let's get this into um, the on the table to discuss it. And I think that where we are perhaps helped a little bit as a profession is in that notion of occupational justice. OK, so, you know, if we look at this as as an, a matter of justice, why should diving just be for X, Y, Z, the able bodied people, the middle class rich, you know, and so that's really changed that, you know, the, the accessibility in terms of being able to fund a diving program that's changed. So. It's also changed in terms of who can dive. If in the past you were told, well, if you've had a stroke, you will never dive. Well, now that's changing too. And so I do see that the notion of occupational justice, which um, kind of starting to drive where the profession is going in the UK as a real advantage in terms of seeing, you know, leisure, not as a privilege, but as a right. And as soon as we see leisure as a right and a human need, then we have all those facets of leisure that we can tap into. Um, now, I suppose where it makes things complicated is in where we situate ourselves as clinicians in occupational therapy. Do we work in a hospital where everything is boom, boom, boom and fast paced? We don't have time to discuss leisure. Are we in a state funded um, service such as the, the NHS or are we in a private funded, uh, privately funded service which has more capacity to say, hey, let's look at your leisure. So I think there's lots of things that come in between us and really thriving in, the, in this field as a profession. But I think we can make it happen if we follow that justice framework. And that is a, a real, I feel that's quite an opening for us in looking at it that way. I love what you said that leisure is a right. It's not a privilege. You know, it's not just for um, the middle class or the rich middle class, whatever, and that it um, is needs to be more accessible. And that um, that is such a um, roadblock for many individuals with disabilities who already experience additional costs to um, their health and medical um, expenses. And then, well, I don't have an extra amount of money to go learn how to scuba dive this expensive, you know, sport. And really it should be something that is so accessible for all and that um, it can be um, an attainable uh, goal to say, I wanna learn how to scuba diving and that it, to me, it just, it breaks my heart that something um, like financial is going to keep someone um, from getting in the water and getting the therapeutic benefits from scuba diving, um, especially when they're, you know, excited and willing and um, hopeful. Um, so I love that, that uh, leisure, leisure is a right. And I think that that's something that um, is, needs to be uh, delivered more here in the U.S. as, as a statement, mm -hmm. um, for sure. But you know what? I think that the pandemic has taught us quite a few things about ourselves as human beings. And I think the fact I was reflecting on that a lot, actually, I could, you know, how did I cope during this pandemic? How did I cope? I coped through leisure. Now, my leisure these days is different. I am an hour from the sea, but I cope through leisure. So for me, leisure time was not a privilege. I would 
literally be in that situation, the headspace of I've got to get out of here. I've got to get to the woods or where or the hills or whatever for an hour to clear my head. And then, you know, that really brought this understanding. I've got to factor this into my day, into my week, into my life, because the pandemic meant that everything was blurred. And I'm sure it was the same for all of you if you were working from home that this boundaries were lost. And so I'm really hopeful that again, here's a little opening for us. See how leisure is important to everybody. Let's have a look at all these channels through which we can be empowered to do leisure in a meaningful way. Um, and again, diving isn't for everybody, but at least we can introduce it if it was accessible. And that is the key really, isn't it? It's about occupational therapists, um, recreational therapists knowing about this knowing about the potential and being able to um, advocate for it mm -hmm. absolutely the amy or rachel did you guys have any questions no i think she yeah you answered both of my both my questions already so i'm okay yes Great. okay so yes. I was just going to comment on this conversation about occupational justice and leisure as a right, because this is a conversation that I had with another OT not too long ago. And we were talking about how scuba diving, we can even pull that back as an occupational justice issue to learn to swim for children with disabilities, because access for children with disabilities to even have the ability to engage in what is a developmental milestone or should be considered a developmental milestone of learning how to swim is really an issue. And I feel like accessing scuba diving really starts for people that are born with disabilities at that place because yeah. they don't have the experiences of typically developing children of being in the water. Yeah. And that's so important. And there's very few programs that even achieve that level for people. So there's so many facets and this is such a lifespan issue in my mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know I completely agree with you. And, and if I look at, you know, access to the water and swim, swim ability and, and water confidence as the, that very basic level. And I think, I mean, we kind of started with that, didn't we? Not everyone feels comfortable in the water. Why don't mm -hmm. they feel comfortable in the water? You know, some parents will prioritize swimming and water confidence, just like what you said, as a developmental milestone, but not everybody. It's not everyone's thing. Um, and, and even in this household, there's one fish and there's one oh, could take it or leave it in the water. And so actually, it's really interesting to see because that was a priority for me. You will swim. And I thought, okay, stop pushing. They're going to hate the water in the end. But actually, isn't it about introducing it and, and building that confidence? And so then one day you can say, you know, that water feels good. Let's try and do some more stuff on the water. But if you don't get to the field, you don't get to the pool, you don't have the facilities to actually be able to access to get into the pool. Or, or the, the specialist wheelchairs that here in the UK are considered a privilege for a, a beach to have, you know, the big wheels that you yep. can wheel people right down to the water. It's a rarity, okay? And we are an island, <laughs> so yep. which should have on every beach access, ramped access, or at least a wheelchair that can go on the sand to allow people to go into the water. We shouldn't have to fundraise to make this a big deal. This should be on every single beach that everyone can access. So it is a matter of justice really. And it is a matter of leveling that playing field for, for all to make water, the sea, the ocean accessible. Yeah, definitely. I think that's it why is. we feel it's so important for us to, we, we reach out to a lot of pools mm -hmm. that are local to communities. And some communities don't even have a pool, right? So they have, you, you know, you have to go to the community next to that, or you have to find a different way to help people get into the water. But that, that's a big, a big deal and a big way that we, as our organization, introduces people to dive in mm -hmm. is in those community settings. Brilliant, brilliant, yeah. Because we are in the middle of the country. And even though we have one of the largest coastlines, the um, lake is not, uh, not an adaptive diver friendly it's not even a regular diver friendly place yeah <laughs> and, and again that is the environment isn't it and and i've i've taught diving in a pool and i've taught diving in the sea and i know i'd always rather be in the sea because as a dive instructor i always used to experience that regression 
So, you know, at the beginning, people were doing really, really well with their skills. Then you go into the water, there's all this changing stuff and it's less controlled. But actually, you've got to start somewhere, don't you? And if you don't have the sea near you, then you've got to you've got to use the pool. And that's what you have. And the pool can be warmer, especially if yeah. you're in the UK. <laughs> yeah, so I actually I have one more kind of wrap up question for you. And. Um, if you were to write a follow-up study to your, to your research that you did all of those years ago, knowing what you know now about adaptive diving, what would it be? <laughs> I've got quite a few things I want to do. Um, I think I would explore this freedom from impairment at a greater depth. I think I would like to explore the various facets that help us perceive us to, to be free. Um, as, as one avenue, and that's a very qualitative route and a very narrative-based route. Um, I would also quite like to explore, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the idea of Blue Mind, so that's the work of Nichols, um, about being around the water, being in the water, bringing mental health. I really want to explore that, and I think that can be really nicely linked to scuba um, because it's linked to other water-based activities. Um, and I suppose part of me, the kind of more scientific brain in me, really wants to find out about the pressure issue and, mm. and, and actually look at, you know, can we actually do a controlled study where we're looking at people who are receiving depth <laughs> and people who are diving in shallow waters and actually look at pain perception relaxation etc as as perhaps a way of starting to explore how should we do because in our brave new world when we're doing scuba with everyone how should we do scuba and with whom with what in what way are there people that would really benefit from a deeper dive are there people that actually would really benefit from a shallow dive a confined water dive so these are questions that i suppose you know maybe we think of it on a case-by-case -case level of course we do we work with people but actually maybe we have this idea that we could have some kind of practice guideline that we could recommend ways of of doing scuba with with different people based on what would be most beneficial for them so these are you know lots of lots of questions that spring to mind but you know had you not uh, amy had you not told me that you had kind of got 10 participants i would have instantly said I want to speak to more people. <laughs> I want to get this out there. I actually just expand the pool, but other people are doing that. And that is fantastic. That is great. So it's building on that evidence base to be yeah. able to have a solid ground to stand on. Yeah. And then we need I to like that. I, I want to throw out that you could even use VR as one of your controls too in that study, right? Because we're, we're looking at, at doing that. I wonder just cognitively, if you yeah. were to see a virtual dive, yeah. what does that do for a person other than inspire them to want to be under the water? <laughs> so Gina, you're absolutely right. And in fact, we pre-COVID, I was just starting to write a grant application using VR in hospitals, not necessarily um, looking at dive, but looking at green spaces, which are also, mm -hmm. you know, therapeutically uh, recognized yeah. but of course COVID came and everybody's priorities changed but we've got to do some VR we have to because it's there it's accessible the tech is phenomenal um, right it could really be very similar um rewards you know cognitively mm -hmm. for whilst people are still unable to leave hospital imagine the potential there so mm, mm. <laughs> Get yeah, right yeah we're there we're we're, we're we're we have a lot of the footage and so yeah. we're yeah. hoping to put it together soon so that'd be great, great. amy what do you want to say oh no nothing no no i just i i agree i think that would be very interesting and even just some things like just coming up from what i've you know with my current research right now even it's just um you know what what is, and it's hard too, because we were speaking about like the, the qualitative aspect to it versus the quantitative aspect, like, oh, can we take blood and like measure, you know, serotonin and dopamine in blood before and after a dive, but like, what is this increase of serotonin or dopamine? What is this, the reason that this, there's a decreased pain sensation? Is it medically? Is it cognitively? Is it, 
you know, it's, it's so many different facets and it's very interesting. And, um, you know, I know in, in the medical world and the insurance world and in the research world, quantitative is valued more, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's like, how can we put this quantitative piece to it's, it is still qualitative because it's still their, their experiences, right? Everybody experiences pain differently and Mm -hmm. everything. It's just, it's a very interesting dynamic, Mm -hmm. Study. I think the key there, Amy, is mixed methods. Yeah, You design mixed methods right from the start. So what you tend to see a lot, I'm, I mean, I'm putting my OT lecturer hat on now, but it, what you tend to see a lot in the field is trials that do, ooh, that's really interesting. Let's now talk to people and they do a quick questionnaire. And that is not mixed mm-hmm. methods. Mixed methods is thinking right from the start. I am going to do this and I'm going to follow A with B and A is gonna be quantitative and B is gonna be qualitative and then I'm gonna synthesize what I get. And maybe I have a three phase study. And so these things are really pricey. They are expensive to to run, but that is the only way we can begin to unpack this really exciting and really um, fascinating area of study of how do we unpack all of that? People's sensations are perceptions, but there is a way of measuring these things but we also want to hear what they think. We want to speak to them as well. And so it mixed methods is the way to go. <laughs> yeah. And I think there's a lot of excitement in the past few years, just about like the ocean in general, like conservation, the ocean. So I'm really hoping that like this trend continues and, you know, maybe in the future we can find some um, uh, donators and people who are absolutely I I think watch this space I would say in a really optimistic way is watch this space because you can't ignore this people cannot ignore how powerful this is and the more work you know Dive Heart do similar charities around the world you can't ignore it the evidence is there it's just we have to publish it don't we we have to be out there we've got to be somebody asked um, in the questions you submitted about being at the table we have to be at the table. <laughs> we have to be the ones advocating. If you're, if yeah. you're not, if you don't see yourself as an advocate, as an occupational therapist, then then you're in the wrong profession because we advocate not just for people and communities, but for things and occupations. And so mm-hmm. this is where, again, we've just got to shout about it, and people will hear eventually. It will come through. Yeah. We're inviting everyone to the table. We want to see more, more research, more therapists, more, you know, that's, that's our big push. We're chasing the medical community and the therapy community, not necessarily divers or the mm-hmm. dive community. Mm-hmm. You know, that's what Great. we're hoping to increase. Great. So I think we're, we're kind of coming to an end of our discussion, but Ladies, thank you all. I think, you know, this was a great conversation and um, I think it'll be inspirational for people to hear and to continue on and join us uh, in the conversation as we move forward. So thank you um, to everybody. Thanks for inviting me. That's been a fantastic hour of my life. I really enjoyed it. Welcome back. Um, What we're going to do is we're going to try and save some of the rest of this evening to talk to our panelists that are have joined us live. So we're currently calling up um, Tori and Amelia, who you saw briefly in the video previously, as well as Eric. And they were um, three of our five occupational therapy uh, doctoral candidates Mm -hmm. that worked with us this year. That's fine. Um, Hang on two seconds. We need to go around to call them out. Um, Tori, Eric, and Amelia, if you want, I think you can unmute yourselves and say hello. And I think Sabrina, our moderator, is going to um, put you on um, spotlight in two seconds. Go through and come out this door. <laughs> all right. Yeah. It's all logistics. Just we'll work it out. It's all about adapting. It's all about adapting. That's very true. Yeah. Yeah. We, we say that at our trips. It's all about adapting. You can do it. You know, on the technical side of things, it's not my wheelhouse, which is why I'm sitting here. <laughs> 
And what well, you we can do as well, people. yeah, what we can do as well is when we get the panelists up on the spotlight, we're going to invite you guys to uh, ask questions in the chat. Our moderator will pass them along to us. I know the first question that we're going to ask each of them to answer for us is how did you find Dive Heart mm -hmm. and uh, what brought you to us? And the second question is what? How exciting is tomorrow going to be? If today <laughs> was this exciting, no, I, I, I can't even imagine yeah, how much think, better tomorrow's going to be. I think um, occupational therapy from all the conversations that I've had with all of our OT doctoral candidates is, is very, very similar to what we're doing underwater in adaptive scuba. And, you know, they'll, they'll articulate that, I'm sure, once we get everything squared away and we get them in front of you. Can hear you. Oh. <laughs> I swear we're going to take this uh, Are we still on the road. Alive? Yep. Oh, we're still Keep alive. going. <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, uh, I think that what they were they were talking about was how similar uh, occupational therapy was to what we do in adaptive uh, scuba and scuba therapy with individuals with disabilities. So. We're um, very That's excited to, to hear from them. Hello. They're with us now, right? Yes, they are. All right. So hi, everybody. Good to see you. Hello. I think, yeah, hopefully we, that you can hear us. Who wants to start? Raise your hand. What brought you to dive? You know what? We're going to start with Eric. I'm going to call on you. Since you I was going to raise my hand anyway. <laughs> um, so my name is Eric Fisk. Um, Doctorate of Occupational Therapy now, Ooh. and I, uh, you know, it's hard to explain. I there's a list of of sites that I was able to do a, a doctoral internship at, and um, I, you know, needed to make it more complicated than um, it was designed to be. And I was looking through the list, and I've heard of all these other places, and I hadn't heard of what dive heart was, uh, or really what adaptive scuba diving is. Um, and really none of the, not many of the faculty members at my school knew anything about it either. So, um, that piqued my interest right from the beginning. And then, uh, I talked to, uh, Professor Mark Kovic, um, at Midwestern and he had done research with Dive Heart. Um, so he explained it a little bit and he explained the concept of, of a created environment, um, to work with people within. And I just wanted to, to, I already, I was just on to do it right there. I was like, that's, that's more up my alley than, you know, and uh, we're going to have a clinic or something like that. So we won because we were the unknown. Pretty much. Well, I knew it would be different. Um, I knew it would be a, a different kinds of hands on, um, and uh, it also, I, I think I got the sense that it, it could use some good expansion. And so I wanted to see how, how I could be involved in that. Yeah, you definitely brought a unique uh, viewpoint to us, something new and uh, that we had not done before. Uh, the other challenge for us when we were working with you is we were still in the midst of COVID. So um, I got to give you a hats off because you really were able to accomplish something when you know, talk about our hands being tied yeah. uh, behind our back. We weren't ha able to be having any of our programs running and things like that. So um, it was great working with you while we worked yeah, ourselves and, through Yeah, and thank that. you for cooperating and, and collaborating really with the other OT doctoral candidates because, you know, the dialogue I think was invaluable between all of you. So Tori and Amy, I think you were kind of neck and neck when you started with us, but technically Tori started first. So why don't we hit, you know, I kind of know your background, but you can share it with, you know, how you came to us. We were another lucked out because of COVID getting these people. Yeah, definitely. Um, so COVID definitely had its plans for me and I think it kind of worked out. Um, it, I mean, it really worked out. This has been a great residency, but my original project was going to be actually in the Keys, um, not too far away from where Dive Heart does a lot of their diving actually at Island Dolphin Care. And it was going to be um, working on animal assisted therapy. Um, my passion in OT has always been with aquatics and water, which is 
Um, we talked about that a little bit in the discussion with Karen Levy, that that's not a typical area for occupational therapists to be involved in, but it's something that I feel really passionate about. Um, and when COVID happened, my original residency project fell through and through a great mind of people who are interested in similar things that I am, I got connected to dive heart and everything just fell into place. Yeah, it was, a, you, um, you also helped us kind of, my theme this year is level up. And so both these people have really helped us level up. Um, they were doing projects with us that were kind of more hands-on right here. And then um, Amy, who we're going to hear from next, she was kind of the outlier. You were remote. You did research versus like a project based um, here in the office or with us here. And um, you are our one experienced diver. The other uh, two candidates, we were lucky enough to be able to teach them how to dive. Um, but uh Amy came and she had already, she was actually already a dive heart buddy when you started with us. Yep. Is that how you found us? I'm, I'm curious as to. Yeah. So actually years ago, I'm from New Jersey um, and beneath the sea is um, held every year in New Jersey. And years ago, before I even got into occupational therapy, before I went back to school, um, I found out about dive heart. Um, my first year in the, my doctoral program, we started our first semester, we started discussing um, our capstone, this 14 week residency that we do. And I just knew that I wanted to com combine my love of scuba diving. Cause I've already been a scuba diver for 10 years prior. I just knew I wanted to combine my love for scuba diving with occupational therapy. Um, I became an adaptive dive buddy while I was already in my occupational therapy program. Um, and that's kind of how I've developed and came to this point to do research. Um, unfortunately with COVID, I did have to do all of my research, um, virtually. I had originally hoped to come on adaptive dive trips, the week long Cozumel trips or uh, Key Largo trips and do my research in person. But, um, unfortunately with COVID, I ha it had to be virtual, but it's okay. Cause my research is complete and, um, it's been a wonderful experience thanks to dive heart awesome. yeah anytime you can you can do scuba diving and help people with disabilities and make the world a better place it's a win-win-win so um i'm with you yeah and i just was hoping to you know obviously doing a project such as tori eric did is amazing but i'm hoping that my research adds to the body of knowledge that is already out there that is is quite limited as dr gail carey levy has been speaking of um, so hopefully that will Oh yeah. I, I don't think, you know, it's, it was great having everybody do something different when they were working with us. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that is something I think that we want to repeat over and over is there's so many different ways that people can work with us, partner with us, do research with us, do pro projects with us, um, that, uh, you know, the possibilities are limitless there. And I just want to continue to see people come through with their new unique take on things. Yeah, I think what each of you did complemented each other. And that was wonderful. Like, again, thank you for collaborating with each other. And I think it added to the total fund of knowledge that we're going to be able to share with individuals that want to know more about adaptive scuba and scuba therapy. So do you have another question for them? Um, you know, in occupational therapy, you, you know, you've drawn some similarities between that and, and adaptive scuba and scuba therapy. Could you like talk a little bit more about how they're similar and how the day-to-day -day tasks that you work with patients on and how what we do are similar? Um, I can take this question because I was talking to Tina Marie this afternoon kind of about it. So there are two different ways that we can look at what we do with dive heart or what occupational therapists can do with dive heart. And first of which could be by looking at adaptive diving in the sense of it being an adaptive sport. And then our role in that situation would be helping people with accessing and participating in that activity. So we would be facilitating people in maybe helping them identify appropriate uh, adaptive equipment or appropriate gear or finding a place to do it or transportation, which is something that Eric really focused on. Or we can look at this in the sense of like the scuba-based therapy lens in which we would be using diving as a modality. 
So in that environment, we would be focusing on the things that you would look, look into in traditional therapy, like fine motor, um, gross motor. You would think about like sequencing and communication, and you'd be focusing on mental health and things like that. But you would be using scuba as the way to meet those outcomes. That's great. So Amy, I have um, an audience question for you. Um, they were curious as to what focus your research was on and if you could share on any of the results. Yes, of course. I did want to just add really quickly before we move off on to the next topic with what Tori was saying. And um, I also feel like a lot of what is done within scuba diving, whether it be in the open water or in the pool, just the preparation of it um, is also can be related to a transfer of other skills. I mean, getting in and out of a wetsuit is similar to, it's more difficult than getting in and out of pants. Um, for those of you who've ever gotten into a wetsuit, but again, there's still that transfer of skills, assembling, um, your gear can still be related to so many different, um, other aspects of life, you know, opening and closing items, fine motor skills. So there is still that transfer of skills that we can focus on as occupational therapists within scuba diving. Um, but as far as, um, my research goes, my research was very similar to Dr. Gail, Carrie, Carrie Levy, um, and Jones. There was two researchers actually with that, but we got to meet Dr. Gail, Carrie, Karen Levy. Um, I found her research and, um, it, there was not much in the occupational science, um, aspect of research. So my research did stem from that. And I was looking at, um, the lived experiences of individuals with mobility adaptations, who participated in scuba diving. Um, I was lucky enough to get 10 participants um, to work or to participate in my research study. Um, and many of my research findings or the my themes that came up in my research were very similar to um, Dr. Uh, Gail Karen Levy's. Um, you know, there was the the big concept of overall well-being, which included both a physical and mental well-being, physical well-being relating to the overall physical experience. Again, many participants in my research study spoke about a freedom, freedom from impairment, freedom of movement, freedom from their wheelchair, which also led to an, oh, sorry, backtrack real quick. And there was also this mental freedom, which was an overall like freedom of thought, which also relates to the theory of flow that Dr. Gail Karen Levy was speaking of. Um, and all these physical feelings, this mental and this physical well-being also related to an overall emotional well-being, which was related to increased self-concepts, um, sense of self, a sense of accomplishment, empowerment, which was all this overall social well-being through their experiences. And then finally, there was a theme of overall Social, um, social well-being, which is related to the social experiences, um, feelings of equality. Again, the buddy theme, um, the buddy teams was brought up. Um, many participants in the research study spoke about um, Dive Heart support, which was a big facilitator in being able to successfully accomplish and successfully dive. And just the dive community in general was so supportive, um, making everyone feel you know, as a team unit, supportive. Um, and then finally, the last theme was part of also this overall social well-being. Many of the participants in my research study spoke about their desire to give back to the community through diving or through other avenues. Um, and I found that very powerful because many of the participants in my study originally spoke about this initial barrier that they felt that they would not be able to dive. And through all their successful experiences of diving, it in, almost led back to this. I, I want other people to recognize that this can be done, um, which I found very powerful. So we talk a lot about Amy, the, the ripple effect, how mm -hmm. with a disability can touch other lives after they've gone through this paradigm shift, you know, and now they're not Johnny in a wheelchair anymore. They're Johnny, the scuba diver. Mm -hmm. and, and that inspires their, their community around them. And you, I heard you describe it, it not as a ripple effect as much as a splash, right? Yeah. Well, cause the ripple effect is, and 
I was very lucky to have, to be able to communicate with Dr. Karen Levy and Jones who provided the feedback. And it was, you know, this ripple effect is almost more linear, whereas there's ripple and splash effect is more like this constant um, because all of these themes and all these experiences are, are all interrelated um, with diving being the initial catalyst of this change and this actual participation in scuba diving as the initial catalyst, whereas all these other themes that emerged um, that relate to well-being are interrelated. Yeah, I, th I think one of the exciting things, Tori, that you did for us was help us create this continuing education program for occupational therapists and you know, ho hopefully physical therapists soon, and then recreational therapists. Do you want to talk any more about that? Yeah. So I um, helped Dive Heart in writing and putting together everything that they've uh, just figured out about adaptive diving so far and all of the ways that they've made it work. Um, and I combined it with all of the knowledge that I had about occupational therapy to develop this course as a way to um, educate practitioners across different therapy professions to get involved. And I, the end goal of the course is not necessarily that the therapists that see it, cause it's only for a one hour course. So reasonably, you're not going to have the experience to get in the water with somebody after one hour, but maybe that course will entice somebody to pursue further certification and to dig into it a little bit more. And at the bare minimum, I'm hoping that that course is going to just put in therapists mind that this is an option for people and for their patients and for their clients. Um, because when we talk about leisure, individuals with disabilities, especially, especially physical disabilities have very limited access to leisure, you know, and we know based on COVID what it feels like to not have access to leisure because all of that stuff got stripped away during this time that we've been in lockdown. So when you talk about what the day-to-day -day life is like for somebody that there is already limited programs available to them to access that, it's really important that therapists are aware of every single opportunity in their community to get somebody involved in anything so that they're not isolated, so that they can interact with other people that are like them, so that they can interact with other able-bodied people that have similar interests as them, and so that they can travel and do all of those things that make life wor worth living. I agree. Um, I think we were inspired. So having worked with you. And I know, Amelia, you put um, some reviews in and input and Eric, you gave input to the continuing education uh, presentation as well. So I thank everybody because it really took a village mm -hmm. <laughs> to put that yeah. together. And Jim and I are really excited because we're just starting to get booked up to give these one hour talks for therapists. And it's inspired us to even think about, you know, how can we move them farther down that line? So most of these therapists, I'm assuming, are going to not be divers because we know the dive community is very small um, to begin with. So we're hoping that maybe we can inspire them or offer a certificate of some sort that would allow them to learn how to scuba dive, allow them to learn how we work with people with disabilities in the water and the considerations we take and things mm -hmm. like that, so that they could possibly get a certificate initially to work just in the confined water arena uh, alongside of a dive heart team. So like the dive heart team would be there just to be the support and the safety net and the therapist, be they rec therapist or PTs or OTs could be there um, doing their thing, um, working with their client and making, uh, you know, giving them that experience, but from their perspective, from the perspective of that type of therapy. Um, and I'm hoping that uh, these three will be some of those people that are able to do that type of work going forward. Um, yeah, this yeah. has truly been an unprecedented year in having all of you come forward and helping us. And, and we just hope that, you know, with your input and input from other OTs and PTs and RTs over the years, that we're able to, to continue to grow adaptive scuba in a way that really is therapeutic because this, from the very beginning, we realized was, was therapy. And we, we reached out to university medical centers around the country and said, guys, we need to start doing research on this. And finally, you, you know, it's happening and it's very exciting. And, and we're hoping that with, with that input, that we can help grow it 
and, and get the medical and the therapy community around the world excited about doing more and more and more research. And, and one of our goals is to have a deep warm water facility to replicate what we see in open water at depth, but with a lot less danger, right? A lot less, you know, water movement, the weather, you no, know, no aquatic life, none of no visibility issues, right? You're in a pool, warm water pool. So that's, that's one of our long, long range goals. Yeah. So Eric, I wanted to um, ask you a question about your, you have a strong connection emphasis uh, to working with veterans. And um, I know when we first started talking and working together, um, you know, that was kind of our focus, right? We were going to try and develop something specifically around the veteran um, community and uh, how scuba diving could um, help impact that community. I know that I've seen it and it kind of ties with what Amelia said about her research where a lot of our veterans, um, they come because that maybe they've had an injury, but they also come because they really feel like they want to help uh, their brothers and sisters. And, and we see that, we see some groups that that's all they do is they work with fellow veterans and you've got the buddies on one side and the, the adaptive divers on the other. And, um, and it just is very uh positive for everyone, but I didn't know if you had some commentary on that because I know you, that was that was a big focus area for you. Yeah, and I'd like to, I, I, you know, I've been reflecting on that lately and, and I know that, um, you know, what I did was help, uh, my largest project was help develop the screening tool, the intake procedure. Um, and it was collaborated with the focus on addressing veterans and it evolved to not necessarily have to be specific, but I'd say that that is optimized for veterans. Um, and it's really designed to get, to get that population involved in a number of different ways and um, from different perspectives too. You know, the, the first perspective we're talking about is um, what is going to be the benefit of someone uh, trying to be involved in the Dive Heart program as a participant or progressing to be a volunteer with Dive Heart. And where I wanted to start with was self-efficacy. That, that's my biggest focus here. Again, the, the largest reason being, um, and, and this has been brought up many times, but currently OTs aren't in the water. That was the first thing that I really noticed, you know, because I'm thinking, okay, what can I do? Um, how can I really give a voice to, to occupational therapy in this environment um, and the first thing I need to do is recognize that we're not directly in the environment. You know, we're on the periphery of it. So the biggest research I found were the benefits, um, the more direct benefits of adaptive diving, uh, increased self-efficacy. And the reason as an occupational therapist, I am so attracted to self-efficacy is because increasing that is what helps um, people manage and maintain chronic conditions and uh, or chronic disabilities. And when I choose to uh, work with the veteran population, these are some of the major things that are issues are those chronic conditions and disabilities. So, um, you know, I was really thinking, how can we really get this involved? So involvement in the program, um, whether it's, you know, starting out as, as just a, a participant of, of an exploratate, uh, ex exploration dive or, you know, advancing to get some kind of certification uh, is increasing their self-efficacy of um, what roles they have and what capabilities they have, what capacity they can be involved in, so in something while living with uh, a disability or chronic condition. Uh, when you increase that, it increases your chances of how well you can maintain your own health. So uh, choosing to be involved in Dive Heart isn't just choosing, to me, isn't just about choosing a leisure activity. It's, a, it's about really gaining the capability and the capacity uh, to care for yourself. Um, and for veterans, they often see that as by caring for others. That gives a, a huge contribution to help themselves. I think the other good perspective I got was how difficult working with the VA could be. So I knew that ahead of time uh, because I had done my research with veterans and uh, I went into VA hospitals and I knocked on people's doors and I still couldn't get um, 
some collaboration. And I was really lucky during this project to actually be directly involved with the OT department at Heinz VA, um, as well as rec therapy and uh, vocational therapy that, that helped, um, you know, some of the piloting aspects of this screening tool. And one of the, the largest doors I think we were able to break down is how um, now the focus for Dive Heart is sharing the information about the adaptive diver programs with the therapists, not just potential participants, because if, you know, if you can reach one participant at a time, or you can reach one therapist who can reach, you know, however many participants are in their caseload. So that's uh, much more expansive. And then the biggest thing, and this is what, you know, if I'm going to say anything about my project, I want to just express this the most. Any kind of practitioner looks towards um, referrals or getting people involved in, in community activities as long as it's reimbursable. That is the biggest thing to them. They can they can make it a small part of their session to talk about that, but that doesn't, in, that doesn't incorporate the follow through of learning about what Dive Heart is and then actually being involved with it at all. It, once you express to a therapist the, all the different you know, areas of occupation that adaptive diving can cover, because now we're just not talking about leisure. We're talking about the self-efficacy to manage your chronic condition all of a sudden, this recommendation, and I like to say recommendation because referral within the in, in the VA world is a whole different game. You don't we want to be kind of weary of that word. The recommendation and helping uh, their patients follow through with this is now a reimbursable, you know, use of their time, getting people involved in, in, in community activities because it is helping them to actually manage their health. So um Again, this this starts with veterans. I think it could can evolve into into use for uh, for for different populations, but but I know it's optimized. The screening tool is optimized for that population, and and that was my biggest concern with it. Yeah, I I, I think you made some really good points there, and it reminded me somewhat of um, early programs that we did out of. Um, oh, it was a rehab hospital that you were. Oh, maybe it was Children's but where they had to challenge. So we would get a group of young people that wanted to be part of the program and they wanted to go on a trip, but the challenge to them was you ha they had to meet certain uh, self-care challenges. In order. Shriners. Shriners, yeah, there you go. You, wanna, yeah. you know better than I, cause you were around then about what they had to do in order to right. be on the trip, right? right. They had to be independent and catheter catheterization and and physical things, but uh, you know also in, in a, in a men mentally in the right place too. And they did a great job of prepping the individuals and then choosing the participants uh, accordingly. Um, I, this is just kind of for anybody, but how does self identity fit into everything that you've learned and seen working with Dive Heart for the individual with the disability? Um, I'll, I'll just say quick, because I think um, I, I had a question to, to Dr. Karen Levy that she addressed very poignantly, and that is that, you know, giving some the opportunity to feel that feeling of freedom of impairment helps them, you know, just be more optimal in what they're trying to achieve. Um, and, and so that seems like a, a really great success in a successful position to put people in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and um, I spoke in my research um, self identities also uh, spoken about in the overall emotional well-being um but again like that self identity and to be able to um positively have a positive set self identity um is or correlates to and is related to like an overall increased quality of life health and well-being when you have that positive self identity when you like have that the positive feelings of empowerment and encouragement and all that that goes under that social well-being um, umbrella and a positive self-identity is under there. I, um, just kind of speaking broadly, and this may be a little bit off topic, but the things that we're talking about here today are like some of the first real discussions that are going on about adaptive diving and scuba and therapy and things like that. And this is so much bigger than working out the 
logistics of getting people to places and money and, you know, liability and things like that. Like we're dealing with like thinking about through the theory and like who in what discipline is responsible for what thing and how to do things with insurance. And this is like all so new. And Tina Marie kind of said it earlier, like it's really taking a village to just think through conceptually how this all works and how it all comes together. Yeah. It's very interesting too. I mean, obviously where Dr. Gail Carey led Care, Dr. Gail Karen Levy is from um, in the UK. There, it's very different there than it is here in the United States. But um, very interestingly, um, just a thought that I had the other day: the World Health Organization a few years ago really put an emphasis on participation and a and a new um, almost definition within the World Health Organization on what participation is, and it. Occupational therapy, it's basically occupational therapy's definition of participation is what the World Health Organization used. And there's goals um, in America as well. Um, and Healthy People 2020, which now there's a new one, Healthy People 2030. Also, they really do highlight that they want more participation in not just, um, you know, therapies, but in leisure activities as well as one of their goals, but yet it's still over an oversight by many therapists. And um, it's just an interesting concept to think about. So question, another question for you. Um, how, how would you propose, you know, when you're, when you're out there in the world or if, if a student fellow, you know, person coming up in occupational therapy, you know, what is it that we can do to invite them to uh, continue the exploration in this and, you know, get more students to, because I feel like um, I'd love to attract current therapists, but I feel like the goldmine is in the people who are studying to become the next generation of therapists that, um, you know, they, they're the ones who have the open minds, like, because you haven't done it. You're, you're not like in the middle of your practice and saying, I don't have time to learn that. Or do you think I, I, you know, should we be targeting those people as well? I mean, obviously we are in the sense that we, we're going to go out there and really um, hope and hopefully introduce um, scuba therapy as an opportunity, as an option to therapists with our continuing education and hopefully like this certification program. Um, but what, what can we do or what would you say to any up and coming um, people studying your field? You know, um, I, I think it's, in, it's just by an occupational therapy, therapist nature and inherently that we are like innovators and we think outside the box and just part of our, our field. Um, so, and me as a scuba diver, it's like, why wouldn't more people want to do this? But of course I have a bias there. Um, I do think that the best reach would be students because um, even if they're not divers, you know, I could imagine I'm a newly graduated student, but I can only imagine what it's, you know, their caseload or their workload is like once, once they're already in the field, um, whereas maybe a student would be more eager, not saying that o current OTs are not eager, but I do see that being potentially a better avenue to go down. They also probably don't have three children and a husband and a dog and a cat at home <laughs> that are uh, that are keeping them from going and exploring scuba diving and being on trips. Well, you know, this, this symposium is going to be, um, this is our first virtual symposium, but it's going to be an amazing tool, I think, that we can use to grow awareness with therapists and, and with, with others around the world about adaptive scuba. We've tried to do that for the last 11 years with all the symposiums that we've done. And, and this one is, is unique, but it's, it's also very focused in ways that um, I, tonight is occupational therapy. And, I, you know, some people may not, you know, awareness, some people may not realize the differences between physical and occupational and recreational therapy and what you do and how that has a very special way of, of um, synergizing really with, with adaptive mm -hmm. scuba. Does anyone want to take that one? Well, I, 
it just reminds me of some conversations Tori and I had um, because we were together on some dives and um, it's, it's just interesting because we had so many, we had such different perspectives. Like I, I'm really involved in, in community-based kind of activities and in, in behavioral health. And she's very much on the orthopedic side. I hope I'm, I'm getting that right. Right, Tori? That's what you yeah, said. That's that's I want to speak for you. And then, and, and so we go, you know, back and forth and, and I remember saying like, let's, you know, get people in the water and be doing these orthopedic things. Let's put splinting on them. And my thing is, why are we going to do that? Like now you need to explain to me what the benefit of this is. So I think for, for up and coming therapists, you know, this, the idea is that this is like I mentioned before, a created environment. So this is a new environment as OTs. What we want to do is avoid contrived environments, which is basically, you know, doing something in, in not someone's natural in, environment, but trying to transfer it to their natural environment. However, this is a very unique opportunity to, to you know, do something um, in an environment that that can be natural to a leisure activity, or it can, uh, you know, help facilitate, uh, I don't know, new learning. There's, there's a lot there that we just don't even know yet. Like if you have, and I think that kind of starts with uh, why Dr. Karen Levy was, was uh, set so much of a precedent for us to, to speak about is, is giving someone that optimal chance to now explore um, some new types of function because now they can, they can function with, with, with being viewed a certain way and being able to operate a certain way. So now what can they do with that? So, I mean, we all just barely scratch the surface of, mm-hmm. of what's there. I think you know, one of my you know, it's interesting to me is that to wrap your head around this, it's, it's really just two major things that happen in my mind when you take a human being underwater to do scuba therapy. And one is you need their brain to wrap around the whole concept of breathing underwater. And, and I think what happens is when they put their face in the water and breathe in, I mean, I've had athletes completely lose it and go, oh my God, I can't do this. Because your brain's going, what are you doing? You're breathing underwater. And, and that puts them, I don't know, tell me what your perspective is on that, but that puts them in a very interesting place in their mind where they have to kind of open up and, and wrap their head around this. The other thing is flying. It's like jump off a building and you don't fall. You jump off a building and you hover in the middle of the intersection, like Superman. And that, so you're flying and you're breathing underwater. What, how can we take that and leverage that with OT to like change lives? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, just talking about the, just like the physical properties of the water, which provides that, like that buoyant, almost gravity eliminated flying feeling. Um, You know, many people say who've been diving that it feels like you're in outer space, right? So the, environment definitely provides, I think, supports and potentially constraints, you know, people who are afraid of the water, people who are afraid of breathing under the water could be a constraint. But this, at the same time, though, I think also looking at overcoming those, whether they're, you know, internal or external barriers, but being able to overcome them, again, leads to this sense of accomplishment. Like, I didn't think I could do it. Other people didn't think I could do it. And then when they successfully do it, that feeling is, it's an amazing feeling and it can relate to this overall, like increased again, as I've been saying, this increased concept of self, new identity and an empowerment to be able to, if I can do this, I can do anything. And that's actually a direct quote from one of my participants, which I loved, but um, it's very empowering. Yeah, I think the key to making this work for occupational therapy is making sure that if we are doing interventions in the water, that there is a direct link to something that happens on land, because that's really what's going to make it therapeutic. If you can translate something that you can successfully do underwater to something that you can do on land and be successful in that, then that's really where the intervention is going to be helpful for people. Yeah. And for those of you who don't know, um, one of occupational therapies, um, I guess mottos is to OTs want you to or help you live your life to the fullest or to its fullest. And if that's through the means of scuba diving, then like, and that's helping you live your life through the fullest, then I don't see any other explanation needed, you know, but um, that's one of my favorite mottos of occupational therapy. Well, we're, we're getting to the end of our two hours. I want to thank you, um, 
our three panelists, Amy and Tori and Eric. I wanna thank you not only for being here tonight, but for working with Dive Heart, for choosing Dive Heart, for helping make us better um, for our participants, for our buddies, and, and just, I, you really um, were such positive um, people to have as part of our team. Mm -hmm. And now you're stuck with us, so you can't disappear <laughs> completely. Um, but I wanted to thank you. I wanna thank everybody in the audience tonight because Thank you for sticking with us and adapting with us and not going away. I hope that you got a lot out of it. Um, this was something that we haven't talked about in depth before, like really focusing on a particular type of therapy. Um, tomorrow, we're gonna be talking about adaptive dive training. So it'll be a little bit more traditional scuba uh, talk, uh, but we have a great, well, a great, uh, you. Rachel and I are talking, so I can't say that we're, but we have a, a really interesting conversation that we talked about um, kind of where we've been, what we're hoping, where we're hoping to go with uh, adaptive training, how we're continuing to try to be innovative. And then um, on Thursday night, we will go back to a, a focus therapy discussion and we'll be uh, having a wonderful presentation from a recreational therapist and then a panel there. Tomorrow's panel will be um, some instructor trainers, adaptive instructor trainers. Uh, and we have our instructor from Malaysia joining us mm -hmm. tomorrow as well. Mm -hmm. And they're gonna be uh, here to answer questions about you know, the challenges, the triumphs, um, what it's like to be an adaptive scuba instructor. Um, I hope you can join us uh, both those days and just learn more and see, you know, some of the most amazing people that continue to work with us. Yeah, we hope that you'll, uh, all of you that are watching, we hope that you will help um, create awareness. Uh, we have yeah, under our media tab at diveheart.org, we have hundreds of news stories, symposiums from the last 11 years. And um, we want you to create awareness so people around the world of different abilities can say, wow, if that person can do that, I can do it. And we want that to be the throwdown, you know, challenge them to imagine the possibilities in their life. So thank you so much for tuning in. We got solutions, and if you want to win, add your contribution. So we are the people like the Constitution. So now was the time for your resolution. You want to be free? Then sing with me. You want to be free? Then take that leap. Take a dive, take a dive, take a dive. Take a dive, take a dive.